Um, I know what it says in the program, but what do you guys really want to talk about? I talked to... What did you think this was? Yeah, yeah. I thought to, that maybe you can share some how you can be a you know, great maybe storyteller, right? Mm -hmm. So that as an entrepreneur or head of the organization, perhaps we can learn some tips. That cool. We can, you know, that's, that was my... All right, idea. good. Yeah. At least I, I might have hit it yeah. close. All right. And unfortunately, my remote... <coughs> yes, ma'am. Um, Along the same lines, like if you are more junior in your career, and we all know that work is about even white collar, especially white collar work, is about relationship building um, and building connections with people, and not just the technical skills you have. How can we use storytelling to help build those relationships so that people feel, you know, we have that trust in the relationship? Does that make sense? So let me let me repeat what I heard. Um, what is your title? I'm a paralegal for the federal government. Okay, and your next job would be what? Uh, would be to go to grad school and become a lawyer. Okay. So I'm pretty junior. Okay, and at which point you would actually have people reporting to you? And... Yes. Okay. So when you talk about a career path and what, what sort of happens, and the fact, I, I will talk about the notion of what happens as you advance through your career path and where storytelling will fit. What you're asking is, at a, at a peer level, what else can you do? Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Great. Hey, Omar, and if you could also touch on what makes a good story and you know how to how to find stories um, for those of us who may be challenged in <laughs> being able to tell tell good stories. Everybody hear that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question was, how do you find a good story? And somebody is challenged with that. I I actually disagree with that. Okay. Um, I think what the issue is, first of all. Personal stories are what connect us to everybody. Uh, I'll show you a couple of structures that we can talk about for archetypal stories. Uh, the challenge, and I know this because I'm an engineer too, right. um, <laughs> what's important in the story? So that is something we'll learn how to pull out. So here's uh, all I want to tell you. If you remember one thing, this is this. Uh, we're dealing with very primal communication. Uh, probably from the time that we were blue-green algae, we were doing storytelling. So this is the very basic communication that we have as human-to-human -human contact. So this is primal. It talks to our DNA. Everything that we do has been in stories. So first thing is, uh, what is a story? And what I want to talk about is that a story is really a construct of metaphors. If I say, you know, that guy is a deer, or, you know, Actually, you heard about this, you know, if, if you listen to football broadcasters, it's like, man, that guy's a gorilla. Well, he's not really a gorilla. <laughs> but, boy, you got a picture in your head of this guy's got, a, you know, maybe he's got hair on his back, maybe he's 400 pounds, maybe he eats bananas, I don't know. But all of a sudden you're getting this idea of what, what that metaphor is. Let's get a little, little bit further. You can take things literally. We did sort of fight the this morning. One of the lines in it is, show us the straight path. Do we really expect a path to show up in front of us? We go, oh, I'm supposed to be on this one. I was three feet over. It's a metaphor. Show us a straight path. So, but what do we do? The metaphors of religion actually, for the religious, become fact. And that becomes part of our, our own thesis. And, and to some extent, that religion is really metaphors that transcend all the categories of, of thought. What's the difference between somebody who believes in religion and an atheist? Is somebody who accepts those metaphors as fact. And it's a construct by which they want to live their life. So now, we can start to do this. And I'm going to throw a couple of slides. I, I did my... Uh, State of the City Address, and I might go back and forth on that, but you would ask about how do you tell a story. When you accept a story, and you, I mean, you ingest it. So, I mean, we're Muslims. There, there are stories that we have embraced and said, this is part of our character. This is part of our community. This is our dogma. This is what we believe. You may make a mistake in some stories and think it's about data. If I give you all the information, 
then it will be clear. Here's what I'll tell you in politics. The data doesn't matter. I can show you a dozen different ways why you should choose A. People don't like it. They want B. Why? Because we've done it. We're familiar with it. We like turkey on Thanksgiving. We don't want halal gyros. <laughs> Which brings up a story. <laughs> Had, it went to a wedding in Los Angeles. And uh, the thought was, uh, some of my friends only eat Zabiha, so we went to this restaurant with the idea that we wanted turkey. Ends up, I mean, they should have just completely gone on the tandoori side and turned the turkey into jerky. <laughs> the mashed potatoes were like, well, we won't make the samosa, so we take the filling. And it was like, you know, gravy or shorba. And it was like, you know, there were no biscuits, it was naan. And we're going, it was just such a miserable experience. But the dogma was, we got to have turkey, it's Thanksgiving. So... <laughs> We actually did a do-over. Um, but in terms of dogma, here, here's, here's how something will hold so tight. Most of us hail from India, Pakistan, etc. Uh, so what's interesting to note, the Egyptians, the Indians, the Chinese, uh, the Mayans, all figured out thousands of years ago, you know what? Kind of look up in the sky, you can figure out, hey, you know what? The sun's in the middle and the planet goes around. Our European brethren had a nifty term. They called it heliocentrism. Here was the problem. They had a guy sitting in the Vatican who said, ah, it doesn't work that way. Because God said, and because I'm the personification of God, the earth is at the center of the universe and everything else revolves around it. That's dogma. That's the law. I am unfallible. Don't even bother screwing with me. Here was the problem. This guy, Nicholas Copernicus, actually wrote a paper on heliocentrism. He said it, one of the challenges that the Catholic Church had, the calendar didn't work. They couldn't figure it out. And when you've got this spread out you know, empire, how do you actually coordinate everybody when nobody's calendar works? So Copernicus writes this story. says, hmm, you know, heliocentrism, okay, that, that actually works. And he realizes that what he's written is heresy. So he chucks it under a desk and doesn't talk to anybody, dies 30 years later. What happens then? This guy, by the name of Giordano Bruno, starts talking about heliocentrism. He goes, you know what? A, this is pretty cool. B, if you actually follow the math in here, the calendar works. Here was a problem. That's heresy. So he was actually tried in the Inquisition and one of the few guys that was literally burned at the stake. Bad way to go. Um, <laughs> then this guy, Galileo, might have heard of him. Invented the telescope, did all kinds of things. He picks up on this idea says, you know, heliocentrism, yeah, you know, this actually works. And a calendar works. He is tried for heresy. He is sentenced to home imprisonment. He was in home imprisonment for three years, goes blind, dies six years later. And the, the, the nifty side note to this, 1992 corresponded with the 400th anniversary of the discovery of the telescope by Galileo, and the Pope pardons him. So it might take a little while, but I mean, this is how tight people will hold on to dogma. You know, you gotta believe. Well, and, and actually, the Church hasn't quite said that heliocentrism works, but if you look at the data, and and for the engineers in the room, you get it. Data works. You know, I don't care what you feel. I care about data. Well, remember, dogma is also very important. And if there's one other thing I can tell you is, uh, when you look at data, data is a fact. But feelings are facts. If you feel angry, doesn't matter why, that's a fact. If you are scared of Muslims, it doesn't matter that it's an irrational fear. The fact that you are afraid is a fact. And I have to address that as a fact also when I start to deal with this. So among the things, why should we tell stories? Well, some of the things, oops, yeah, there we go. Among the things we're trying to do, especially in a complex world, is communicate very complex ideas very concisely. So I can sit here and tell you all the data, how to draw a conclusion. It's a hell of a lot easier if I got a good story to hook you and bring you in. Now, there was a question about what does it mean for an executive? 
Here's something that you know your job isn't. As you start to move up in your career, you are no longer going to be the person who's actually drafting contracts or chasing signatures. You're not going to be the person actually doing the coding. You may not actually run the blood labs. But now your job is trying to look at the people coming up behind you, get them into their roles, and then you start to do more and more executive work. I mean, there was one point in time that I had serious programming chops. I don't want to get near code again. It's, you know, I, I realize code is something. I hire kids under 30. I saw, call them kids. You put them in a room, you know, you, and you feed them pizza because it's flat. You can slide it under a door. So the pizza goes under the door, code comes out over the top. And they're too hopped up on caffeine and adrenaline to know that I'm working them to death. <laughs> it's great, but you can do that because now you're, now you're, you're smarter. Uh, and scars, be proud of scars, guys. Scars work. Uh, so now your your job is no longer frontline. How do we work on this stuff? It has now gone to how do we lead a team? Here's something else I'll tell you. Something I didn't realize about being mayor. Yes, I have to do storytelling. And you will end up telling the same story again and again and again and again. One thing I learned, it takes me another half hour to an hour to buy groceries. Because I'll be in the, fr and I've also learned frozen foods last. Um, <laughs> because you'll be picking stuff up and somebody will say, hey, I got a problem. Um, you know, I live near a Grail Park and the child, you know, People are parking in my driveway, They're, you know, the, the little league practice. They want to tell you their story. Their story is critical. And among the things you're going to have to do, more than even you telling your story, is you have to be able to listen to stories. And you have to honor that story. If you are willing, you know, and here's what I will also tell you is I've been able to, quote, vote against people. That if, you know, they see an issue going this way, I'm going to vote another way. Part of it is, you know what, at least he listened. I don't agree with him, but he listened to me. He took what I had to say seriously. Not honoring somebody's story is one of the biggest mistakes that we make as a, you know, just generally. But especially if you start to move into elected office or if you start to move into leadership roles, recognize that people's stories are sacred. And sharing that is very, very important. All right, so now you're an executive. You got a team. What do you have to do to them? Ideally, you want to inspire passion. You need to motivate a team. Uh, everybody understands, you know, it's, it's hard to hire good people. But if you've got good people, chances are, I mean, you wish you could hire good people. You hire a lot of average people, and what you're really trying to do is get average people to do much far above average work. So they've got to be inspired. They've got to feel some passion. You want to deliver on some very high quality. That's critical. How about focus? If you're in a company, if you're trying to do everything, it is laser focus. Scott McNeely had this great statement. It says, Kind of a funny guy. He plays hockey. Uh, he was the uh, CEO of Sun for a while. Um, really loved David Letterman. Always starts off his speeches with top ten lists. But one of his favorite statements is, we're going to put all of our wood behind one arrow. You know, that's the damn thing. We're going to kill it. I used to I'd still say, it's like, you know, guys, let me explain you something. i got to kill it, strap it to the bumper, drag it home so we have meat for the winter. That's it. You know? <laughs> if we don't do it, we're hungry. So... Focus, focus, focus. You got to deliver on the company's core mission. Whatever your mission for the company is, this is how you got to deliver it. And lastly, obviously, we got to make profit. Uh, even nonprofits, you've got to have something that is sustaining and maintain the core mission. I wanted to talk about this work. Kind of an interesting thought. Inspire actually comes from the from a root, which means to breathe. So part of what you're doing with inspiring is telling people to breathe in something that puts them into a state of something better. 
Conversely, there was an interesting thing. If you look at the word conspire, also conspiracy, means to breathe together. But in this case, we want to inspire. <laughs> <laughs> Just waiting, there's going to be somebody who's... I don't like the word non-Muslim. I like neighbors. <laughs> I have no responsibility to non-Muslims, but I do have responsibilities to my neighbors. So, you know, there's chances are there's some neighbor here saying, I knew they were going to talk about conspiracies. <laughs> this is not a college that you need to go to. It's going to happen. You always wish, oh yeah, these are off the record, right? They've got a camera in my face with a red light. <laughs> no pressure. Yes, this will be on the YouTube. <laughs> the damned interwebs. Um, this is not the school that you want your kids to go to. This is what you need to look at when you're talking about your story. What is the most important thing? Determine that. What is the narrative? Where do you want people to go? What is it that you want them to pull out of this story? When they can figure that out, then the other question is you want to ask, what does the story mean to me? And how do I start to push that out? So the other thing we want to talk about is how do you start to discover the structure of a story. By the way, I'm going to give you a couple of different structures today that will work. Um, first is, use the most important thing. That's the backbone. Now, how do we start to hang additional bones off of this? The details hang off that backbone. Now they become the ribs, they become the vertebrae, they become the legs. Then you worry about words. You don't start the other way. Boy, this is a great sound bite. Maybe I'll build a speech around it. Start with the most important thing. Trust me, you'll, you'll work your way down. So what do you do as a storyteller? There are a couple things. Uh, first thing was, if you are talking to an audience, you want to unite them. So one of the first things I did initially, I, I kind of did the uh, first three. We'll deal with the fourth later. But we tried to unite the audience. What are we here for? So I kind of asked that question. Second of all, I invited you to say, okay, let's, let's all have a conversation. And what I'm not doing is trying to shove something at you. This is an offer. I can't shove a story any more than I can shove you to believe data. But if I offer a story and say, here's one way to look at the world, then it's your opportunity to take my invitation and look at it. Lastly, the other thing you have to do is at the end of the story, you have to acknowledge. How do people feel? What did they take out of it? I'll start with this. When you are doing storytelling, it's not about, you know, there, there are some great stories that are told by people who are, have you ever seen, how many kids, how many people were kids who went to the library for story hour? Anybody did that? All right. You know what they did? You know, you got the lady with the bun, and she would do this. And Jack climbed the beanstalk. <laughs> the giant was pissed. You know, so, <laughs> I grew up in the South. We had different librarians. <laughs> yeah, when you got a whole whole lot of folks where the family tree don't fork, it's. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you from the South, you understand. Um, there was a drama in it. It wasn't about the fact that this was, you know, she wasn't Lawrence Olivier giving me a speech. This was somebody who built a sense of drama that actually worked for the audience. So part of what you're going to do is recognize that when you're delivering your story, it's not so much about the data, it's about the drama. Now let's talk about some structure. Here's a typical story. What are we doing? Isn't this great? Uh, I'll use this example. Let's pretend for a minute we're Hewlett Packard. We sell computers. Okay, guys, what do we do? We sell computers. The next thing we're going to talk about is how we do it. You know what? We buy the best damn chips we can find. We have incredibly Talented people put it together, and we make computers. We do it so that our profit holders and our shareholders can enjoy profit, and people can use computer technology. 
Perfectly acceptable story. Guess what? Really damned ordinary. So what if, what if we do this? Now let's pretend that we're Apple. We do this because we believe in the digital future. We believe data, music, movies, communication, and intelligence will all be digital. How we do it? We make beautiful devices that are a joy to hold. What we're doing today, we're unveiling the iPod. I want to go out and buy the damn thing. <laughs> I want to work for Apple. Slightly different construct, but where, where are we starting? The why is critical. It tells us what's our purpose for thing. I mean, the big question, why are we here? That's where you start. So let's, let's try a different way. Go to the uncle speak. Let's talk about prayer. Okay. Brothers, what do we do? We pray. You pray by doing the wudu. Get the mishwak stick. Brothers, turban, please. Why? Because we're told. Perfectly valid. The data is all correct. Why Muslims pray is so that we can have a connection to the Creator. That on a periodic basis, we get to renew a point that says this part of divine influences how we interact. How we do it is through a ritual, set of rituals prescribed on a daily basis. And what we're doing is called prayer. Now, how many people want to go to the prayer room? Mm -hmm. Same stuff, just different way to go at it. So I wanted to talk about one storyteller I worked with in, in particular, Jim Barksdale. Jim was hired as CEO of Netscape. Uh, he was actually employee number 40. Uh, I came into Netscape a little bit later as the webmaster. Uh, if you ever get a chance to meet Jim, he will give you this thick as molasses Mississippi accent. And he will speak kind of slow and kind of quiet. And he'll make you think that he's stupid. And that's your first mistake. <laughs> but what he would do is he used stories. And he used metaphors. So one story construct I want to talk to you about is very short metaphors. And how did it work to deal in Netscape? Now to tell you what was going on in Netscape, here's a couple things you need to know. First of all, we hired them young. A lot of these kids, and they really were kids, sometimes didn't finish college. We just grabbed them. I mean, if you know, if you could fog a mirror, had a driver's license, and knew how to code, get in here. You're, you're hired. So you got very young staff. Second of all, for, for a lot of these kids, it was their first gig. So they're away from parents. I mean, this was almost like a college dorm in a lot of cases. You know, they're away from parents. They get to be in this really cool cubicle farm. You know, they actually met the naked guy. Yes, we did have, there was the term, everybody's heard of the term skinny dipping, which is, you know, swimming. There's also skinny hacking. Um, and we actually did have a, it was honest to God, the dress code at Netscape was you had to dress. <laughs> Clothing was not optional. You had to dress. So as you can imagine, we had a lot of distractions. So you have a young group. They're, they're excited. It's their first job. They're really distracted. And here was the other thing. There were very few grown-ups in the place. All right, so if you thought herding cats was fun, try a bunch of teenagers hopped up on ethanol and caffeine. It's just, it's chaos. So what did Jim do? Well... Jim had a couple of short stories, but one saying that kind of came out, and I actually I have a book here. This is kind of, oops, there it is. We took a lot of Jim's sayings, and uh, the day that we sold Netscape to AOL, we actually had put out a book. It's called The Main Thing. Because this is something that Jim always used to say. 
And, you, know, you got a picture of that Mississippi thing? You know, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> now, it's one thing to yell at a bunch of college kids and say, Focus, damn it! But it's another thing to say, It's the main thing. Don't worry about that other crap. I know Bill Gates wants you dead. <laughs> The Justice Department, this is a true story, the Justice Department subpoenaed my desk. A bunch of guys came in, put tape over my desk, called it out, I'm like, what the hell do I do now? <laughs> this is a distraction, but no, that's not the main thing. Don't worry about that. Your job is this. He had three rules. Now, how is he going to tell a bunch of hopped up teenagers about the three rules? You needed to work off autonomously. You need to be able to make decisions and you need to be able to move on. So he'd say, I got three rules. Rule number one, if you see a snake, kill it. <laughs> don't call your buddies. Don't call a committee. Don't have a damn study. Kill the damn snake. Rule number two, don't play with dead snakes. <laughs> it's dead. Move along. Rule number three, all opportunities start off looking like snakes. Everybody was in charge. And you know, occasionally you would see, we actually had a sheet that came up called Snake Tracker. And part of it was, what did you kill? You know, it's like, you know what, uh, if you really want to get into some lore, there was a release of Netscape that we called Cheddar. Uh, Mark Andreessen from, was, was from Wisconsin, still is. Um, He's not dead yet, but uh, originally he was from Wisconsin. And uh, the releases of software were named after cheeses. So we had, you know, Cheddar and Munster. And, you know, Cheddar, you know, I would say, oh, well, I pulled this out of Cheddar. I mean, if you were just walking around, like, what the hell? Did you but that was what happened. Again, there weren't a lot of grown ups. So, how do you tell people that part of the job is for them to make decisions? Jim would say, I wasn't born yesterday, and I didn't just fall off a turnip truck. But I learned a long time ago, if you're real clear and get smart people together, they'll figure it out. It's your job to do it. Don't come running to me for answers every time. You've got to do it. There was also a question about focus. <laughs> and at some point in time, engineers know you'll start to have a lot of debate. Finally, you just got to put down the foot and say, listen, I don't care. If I tell you a chicken can pull a tractor trailer, hitch the damn thing up. <laughs> <laughs> now, it sounds funny, but Netscape would have a different business model almost every 90 days. And it's like, the international strategy is really important. I need this in 90 days. Okay, we get there. Guess what? The world changed. Microsoft has done this. The Department of Justice has done that. Browser for sales go we're going to go that way. And in 90 days, we're going to be there. Move your butts. How do you set the pace? Again, a short story that Jim loved. Say in the morning, when the lion gets up, he knows that he's got to be faster than a gazelle, or he's going hungry. Gazelle gets up in the morning, knows he's got to be faster than the lion, or he's going to be eaten. So I don't care what you're doing, but every morning you better come in here and you better be working your butt off. Now there's a lot of ways to tell people that you expect them to work hard. You wanted them to go to deadlines. You wanted them to hit every milestone efficiently and very, very well. But these stories were things that literally you can talk to the thousands of people who worked at Netscape and they'll repeat these things verbatim. I'm going to talk about a couple of different storytellers. I worked at Discovery Channel for a number of years. And these are some of the storytellers that I got a chance to work with. Uh, Ian Douglas Hamilton runs the uh, Save the Elephants Foundation. One of the most passionate people that you'll ever meet, and if you've heard of elephant poaching, it's because of Ian. Hugo Van Lauwek is also known as Mr. Jane Goodall, but if you know anything about cheetahs, cheetah behavior, lions, how that works, it was because of, of Hugo. Steve Burns has done some of the most amazing wildlife imagery for National Geographic, the BBC, uh, TV New Zealand, uh, and Discovery. 
Greg Moyer, probably one of the most amazing editors Discovery Channel and now Scripps ever had, who had a strong sense of story and what would connect with, with us. Steve Irwin, if you ever saw The Croc Hunter on television, it wasn't an act. He was absolutely nuts. Um, he was, he didn't drink caffeine, but you would swear he just kind of freebased the stuff. Um, and there's plenty of Steve stories. Then James Burke. Now James is a very interesting guy. Originally with the BBC, he covered a lot of the Apollo missions. Then he wrote uh, an interesting series called The Day the Universe Changed. Eventually it became Connections, and then Connections 2 and Connections 3. He's a historian. And it sounds kind of funny that this Brit tells stories in sort of an African structure. Now what does that mean? The Western mentality of a structure is there's a beginning, a middle, and end. There's one narrative. African structure is a little bit different. You take little bits of stories, and they feed into a larger narrative. So here's how I did this at the State of the, State of the City address. If you want to talk about you know, what was you know, MIT, the most important thing, our city is going through some very, very significant changes. We're changing police. Literally, we outsourced our police. We uh, took a police force that had been around for 85 years, and we moved them out. We're changing fire. We're changing so much. And what I wanted people to realize was that change is tough, and institutions, which we deal with, have a very hard time for change, and that change meets with very strong resistance. That's what I wanted people to leave with. So how do I start to put it together? I started talking about the 12th century of Europe. It's considered the Dark Ages. The technology that really launched Europe out of the Dark Ages, strangely enough, was this. It was a loom. This loom was developed so that it had foot pedals. What it did was, you could separate the threads, and you had this nifty little shuttle, and the weaver could move the shuttle back and forth. That was the technology change. Production of cloth shot up like a rocket. It was amazing. Now you could make cloth much, much faster as opposed to doing it individually. But what happened? Riots on the scale you can't possibly imagine. The weaver's union got together. Now this is 12th century, the Dark Ages. What's interesting is, in amazingly modern thinking, they said, this technology is going to put weavers out of work. They went about smashing the looms, killing the guys who made the looms, and causing general mayhem throughout Europe. Here's the problem. Market forces kept going, and now everybody's using the new looms for new cloth. So, great, we've got these looms, things are moving great. No, there's more problem. There was more riots. Well, what happened this time? Now it's the thread makers. The thread makers can't keep up with the demand, so they're starting to make trouble. The prices are going up. What do we do now? Well, eventually somebody goes to China, finds this nifty little device called a spinning wheel. So I say, hey, great, now we can make all the thread we want. Here's an even better idea. Put the spinning wheel and the loom together, more cloth than you know what to do with. Guess what? Even more riots. Uh, this time it came from the woolen industry. The problem is people are using plants because they're making linen. They're not using wool, which you wanted to use. So now they want protectionist measures into place. Doesn't matter. People like this cheap cloth. So what happens? They buy the cloth, they wear it out, and they throw it away. So all throughout Europe is this growing pile of rags. Everywhere you look, huge pile of rags. And what happens? Well, the price of paper drops like a rock. And why is that? Well, the best material that you can make paper out of is free. It's everywhere. So people are grabbing paper. There's so much paper around your You can put it up on the walls. It's great. How, I mean, who could not like this? Well, there's still more problems. We get more riots. Once again, it comes from the woolen industry. And they're pissed off because now people are using this cheap paper and they're not using parchment, which comes from sheepskin. So they're trying to get more protectionist measures into place, saying, well, now legal documents need to be in you know, sheepskin. doesn't matter. That gets thrown away. What happens then? Well, again, more riots. This time it was from the Writers Guild. Now the problem is Black Death has gripped Europe. Two-thirds of Europe is dead, one-third is inheriting like crazy. The problem is there's not enough writing talent to go around to do all the damn documentation. So the writers are going, well, we, we, we need some more money. So what happens? 
1450, this guy named Gutenberg comes up with this great idea. Hey, you know what? How about a printing press? That would be fun, wouldn't it? Riots in the most amazing places, the Vatican. The Vatican needs a printing press like he needs a hole in the head. Because, I mean, it's not about the Gutenberg Bible. You have a printing press, this will lead to something very dangerous called free thinking. So you don't want that. Now, the way I imagine it, somebody kind of went over to the Pope, hit him with an elbow and said, um, Your Holiness, I got an idea. You can print indulgences. Now, I realize I'm in a Muslim audience. So an indulgence, mm -hmm. I think the only way to describe it is sort of a get-out-of-hell-free card. <laughs> think of it as sort of, you know, the, the sinner's bank and ATM. As long as you kept a positive bank balance with the Pope, you could withdraw sin as you like it. This is great. They are selling indulgences like it's nobody's business. The Vatican makes a mint. They pay off the construction of the Vatican. They pay off Michelangelo's bill. <laughs> and people are excited. I mean, the, the, the Pope is really having a great time with this. Except it really ticks off one German cleric who just gets really upset with this idea of cash and carry salvation. He does just, he nails a few mild remarks up on the wall. And so what happens? As a result of advances in textile technology, we have the Reformation. I simplify. <laughs> <laughs> but what you're starting to see is the inevitable march toward a significant social change fought by institutions violently every step of the way. So what I wanted to tell our city was, as much as you're seeing what we're changing in terms of police and fire and basic infrastructure, the rancor that we're going through is expected. Don't freak out. I want to go with one more struggle. <coughs> Absolutely one of my heroes, Joseph Campbell. If you had a chance to read the book, uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, uh, to me, it was a changing book for me, at least in terms of talking about how myth works for us. Joseph Campbell has uh, been a driving force for a number of writers. And uh, what I wanted to do was talk about one structure that he put forward, and let's do a little comparison. Two movies that most people know about, Star Wars and Harry Potter. They seem like different movies, but is the story different, really? Okay, let's think about this. So, Luke Skywalker, orphan, lives on Tatooine with his uncle and aunt. Harry Potter, orphan, lives with his uncle and aunt. Okay, that, that sounds good. All right, what else? Luke was rescued from aliens by Ben Kenobi. He's a Jedi Knight. Okay, well, let's see here. Harry Potter was rescued from muggles by a bearded guy named Hagrid. Okay, well, we're getting closer. Right, let's think we can keep going. Um, Luke, your father, was a Jedi and one of the best damn pilots I've ever seen and a good friend. <laughs> Hagrid turns around and says, you know, Harry, your, your dad was a hell of a wizard and just the most amazing Quidditch seeker I've ever seen. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. Luke starts to learn how to use a lightsaber and become, starts training as a Jedi. Harry starts to learn how to use a wand, starts training as a wizard. Goes out, makes some friends, has some strange adventures. Goes out, has some adventures, makes some friends. Has that climactic flight of the Death Star, literally flying into the Valley of Death. I mean, that was cool. <laughs> you know, you gotta pull up number five, I can't do it! It, it was great. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, I'm there. It's a... You know, makes a direct hit, you know, what, what happens? There was, the, there was a point, you use the force, Luke, but you're turning off your computer. What, I'm, I'm okay. You know, and, oh. Okay, so what happens then? I grew up with, you know, Warner Brothers was such an integral part of my life. <laughs> so what happens? Yeah, Harry Potter does essentially the same thing. Now he does this amazing catch in the Quidditch match, you know, defeats Slytherin. And at the end, he has to face 
the guy who killed his aunt and uncle. He has to face the guy that killed his parents. He gets medals. I was always pissed that Chewbacca didn't get a medal. <laughs> it just seemed wrong. It's like Chewbacca flew too. But, you know. They get the house cup. What's this story called? It's actually the hero's journey. It's a fairly straightforward thing, and there are a number of pieces that you can put to it. We'll hit just a couple. There's the call to the adventure, crossing the threshold. Now we're going into some place that we don't understand. This is a new world. How are you going to face it? You go into the belly of the whale. Now you're really being tested. There are trials. Maybe you have to face your own death. You return. There's some sort of help from outside that you've been able to do. And now you're the master of two worlds. So what happens? Luke comes back. Well, you know, before he was, he was okay. Now he comes back and he's the master of his own fate and now can help a new world. What happened in Avatar? You had a paralyzed marine go through a series of adventures, go through the underworld, come back out, and now what is he? He is now a fully functioning member of two worlds. He can control the sky people, he can, you know, lead avatars, etc. One of the things that they do, uh, this is one way to look at the hero's journey, is uh, you actually go counterclockwise. Sounds a little odd to do that, but normal people would go clockwise. The hero's journey, you go against the grain. But it's a three-act system. Can you imagine the story of our prophet in this metaphor? Living in the ordinary world, felt uneasy, goes off, receives a message, is told to do some fairly impossible things. How do you build a nation? How do you start to form a religion? Coming in, was he tested? Did he actually go to a real cave? What were the ordeals that occurred? Death of children, death of spouse, death of the closest people around him still holding everybody together. Finally realizing that real power, to some extent, was through being Muslim. Not through, not through a sword, but by what did that code mean? The road back to Hitchin. Finally it's back. You can do this with Christ, you can do this with Moses. This is a story that is sort of burned into our DNA. and It's something that we actually understand very, very viscerally. It's a structure that you can start to think about. If you look at the great CEOs, how do they describe to their own troops? How do you take on a challenge? If you're Netscape, you're 400 guys, and you're going to take on Microsoft? Seriously? I mean, you know, most bugs on a windshield have more lifespan than this. But guys, let me tell you, we're going to change the world. This is an adventure. You might get your desk subpoenaed. <laughs> we may have layoffs. We may get dragged into court. We may find the loss of half of our revenue, but we're going to keep going. And what we are going to do is change the world. That was the narrative inside of Netscape. Can you imagine the narrative inside of your own company? Campbell made the idea that the hero's journey and the labyrinth that we're all facing in terms of the story that we are trying to put together for our own narrative has already been traveled. So it is something that by simply looking at the stories and understanding the examples of those who came before us, the path is fairly clear. I don't need to go through very long stories to get you to understand straightforward concepts and go, oh, that makes sense. Lastly, I'm going to give you an invitation. The first full weekend of October, in a little town in Tennessee called Jonesboro, there is a storytelling festival. For about, coming up on 40 years now, they invite 30 storytellers from around the world. About 20,000 people will show up in this town that is maybe the size of this hotel. They set up big honking circus tents, and the special effects are a microphone. That's it. And for three straight days, people are telling stories. Everything from folk tales to original stories to fairy tales to classic things that you've heard. But doing very, very primitive 
audience member storytelling. Been going to this thing since the early 90s. I've said it before, I'm a digital guy, but souls are analog. This is getting analog. We're dealing with something very, very primal. Take your time, think about your structure, and realize it's not about the data, it's about the drama. Let's go for questions, if there are any. If not, <laughs> how are we doing on time? I don't even know. Oi! <laughs> Tell them the story. Um, there was there was one story I was thinking about that uh, is uh, <laughs> a good friend of mine, Bill Lepp. He can't spell his name. He spells it B I L. <laughs> he um, he is an ordained minister in West Virginia, and uh, he tells stories and. Uh, so he told me this story, I'll try it, see, it, see if you guys can get it. Uh, he explained that he had a dog. Uh, the dog's name is Buck. Buck was the product of... His, Buck's mama was a German shepherd. His dad was a really determined and very prolific bass town. So you can imagine the size <laughs> difference. What Buck got in the deal, I mean, he got his mama's good looks, but he got his daddy's legs. In it. So he's about like a half dog high and about a dog and a half long. I mean, he's kind of like a dog who swallowed a Ford sedan. I mean, that's, that's kind of <laughs> Buck. And Buck was considered sort of a canine idiot savant. Um, if you held up a plate where you had eggs that morning, he would go out to the hen house and grab the chicken. That's one. Uh, and Bill said, yeah, you know, I held up a buffalo wing to him. The next time he showed up, you know, with a bottle of barbecue sauce and some blue cheese. It was amazing. <laughs> now, the problem was, you know, Bill Bill is a hunter. He likes to go out hunting. But Buck was fairly gun shy. So, you know, he'd hear the gun go off and Buck would go running in the other direction. He thought, you know, i got to find a way to break this dog of, you know, feeling gun shy. So, he was looking at Buck and Buck was asleep. And How many people have dogs? You see dogs? You ever seen dogs dream? Yeah, I mean, it's hilarious. Yeah, they, they're just kind of, oh, this is great. So, I mean, Buck is either, you know, dreaming of, you know, very short dogs or something else. But he says, you know, I'm going to get him over this this issue of gun shyness. So he wakes up Buck, grabs his 30-30, grabs a length of rope, goes outside and says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. So ties the loop around Buck's neck, ties it to his belt loop, and he takes a paper target and puts it on the compost pile. This is West Virginia. Uh, and draws a target on it, goes over to Buck, shows Buck the shell. Says, yeah, Buck, got it. Loads it up, bam! And somehow or another, Buck had this idea that he was supposed to chase the damn bullet. <laughs> <laughs> so Buck heads off and pulls Bill right out of his boots. And Buck goes straight through the compost pile and I don't know if, if you can imagine getting dragged head first through a pile of compost. <laughs> we all had an election year. You know what it is. So he gets dragged through, and every time it ricocheted off a tree, went over a branch, whatever else, Buck was with him. Just the whole way. And Bill is flapping around, just kind of going... Blah, 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 blah. And so the way it happens now is he comes up to the railroad tracks where a monster train oh, no. of 168 cars filled with, i, I, I got to get the number right, 19,364 tons of pure West by God, Virginia, bituminous coal, is going through. The bullet slams into the train, and the buck stopped there. But Bill went past the buck and goes screaming past. And it was about 12 degrees outside, so he's screaming. Hits the side of the train. His mouth is open, and his tongue sticks to the side of the train. <laughs> so, as he's doing this, because Buck had stopped, it ripped his blue jeans off, so he's in his boxers. Tongue stuck to that train like scandal to a politician. And, as Bill describes it, he's holding onto his boxers because he's figuring, 
getting your tongue stuck to this thing is bad. There's other stuff I don't want stuck here. <laughs> and now the train had picked up some speed, so now Bill's starting to flap. And he's trying to hold on, but now his, his mouth is open, and the wind is going through, and he's got this, you know, sort of, it's his tongue on one side and the drool on the other side. So he says, the drool kept going, but it was freezing fast enough, and eventually I had this 50-foot wing of drool hanging off of my arm. So now I'm, I'm hanging on the side of the train, and somehow or another, the drag and the lift and the coefficients of other stuff started to work, and the train started to take off. So he says, well, you know, eventually we got that thing airborne, and I'm saying, well, you know, it's kind of cool. So he's taking the train around, does a loop-to-loop, -loop, does a hammerhead stall, realizes he doesn't have a pilot's license, and he <laughs> says, you know, I, I don't want to get in trouble with the FAA, and I, the CSNX police are probably going to get ticked off. So he figures out he can land that train back on the, on the rail, so he gets down, he somehow has managed to do the landing, and then, as he liked to describe, the real trouble starts. Because uh, now the train's starting to go through a tunnel, and if you've seen train tunnels, they're only really wide enough for, like, the train. <laughs> and so, you know, there he is, a you know, tongue on the side, and his head slams into the side of the tunnel. The train keeps going through, and his tongue is getting stretched out, stretched out, stretched out. Oh, and, and you know, eventually, the train's starting to slow. And so, one of two things are going to happen: either the train's going to stop, or his tongue's going to get ripped out. And he's, Something has got to give. <laughs> Eventually, the train broke loose. The tongue, now 40 feet long, runs back out through the tunnel, kind of like a rubber band, fires Bill up into the air. And so now he's flying through the air with Bill, boxer shorts, 40-foot tongue. Falls down. Eventually, he comes through some power lines. And his tongue does a half hitch around the power line. So he's hanging over the ground, about 10 feet up. He's got more hang time than Michael Jordan right now. He's just, what do you do? And a little bird comes and lands on his head. And that's when he saw the bear. So the bear, <laughs> it's, you know, the bear is waking up from hibernation. So comes out of his cave, looks up, and there's this X-rated pinata up in front of him. And the bear's kind of hungry, so... You're not going to believe this part. He, uh, <laughs> he reaches into his cave and he pulls out a folding ladder and an aluminum baseball bat. <laughs> so the bear climbs the ladder and he gets up on that top step, the one that says, don't step here. He's taking a couple of practice swings, ready to deal the death blow. And then Buck, you remember Buck? <laughs> Buck sees this assesses the situation, runs up the ladder, and bites the bear on the butt. Which causes the bear to lose his balance, grabbing Bill by the ankles. So now, the bird, Bill, bear, buck. What apparently happens now is the clove hitch is tied tight, closing a 60,000 volt circuit that nobody had counted on. It blew the hair off the bear, blew the fur off of buck, blew the feathers off, off the bird, and everybody goes hurling into the sky. So you've got Bill, the naked jaybird, the, you know, the buck naked bear and the bear naked buck, uh, all <laughs> flying through the air. Uh, eventually, you know, Bill's tongue shrinks back, the bird gets his feathers back, buck gets his hair back, the bear's gone somewhere else. And it's something you would hope you can learn from. At least you kind of hoped it. And what Bill really came up with is the idea is, you know, sometimes just let sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> <laughs>
The other thing I will tell you is that it took me, I mean, depending on the story, because um, I've told at different uh, festivals and stuff like that, it took me a while to figure out where was my strongest voice. When I was describing the, the librarian, there, there are some people who are stunningly compelling. I say, and Jack, cut down the beanstalk. <laughs> I suck at that. I, I can't do that. There are other people who say, Bob did this. So-and-so did this. Miriam, and she was doing this. It was amazing. I can't do that. I, I really tend to be more of a first-person storyteller. It took me a while to find out what my voice was. And part of it is, I, I would recommend a group like Toastmasters to go and start to work on your stories. Work on where your strongest voice is, and from there, you can start to feel what's authentic. And that's the real issue, is what's authentic. Um, if you're telling a story and you're a phony, people get it. Okay. So. Well, I see a question about your story community in America has been doing in terms of telling its various stories. I mean, even in this room right now, if, if you think about who's in this room, there are some amazing stories. <coughs> I'm thinking about James E's experience and others. And, and they're being told, and you have some efforts, but, you know, how would you encourage uh, people to tell their stories um, where and how and is it something you do in writing? Is it something you do uh, in, you know, in spoken uh, settings, um, etc.? I mean, in terms of connecting, I guess it's a broader question. I'm not even sure what I'm asking. <laughs> Let me try this. <laughs> we have people who are very skilled at public relations, and we need to take that advice. The second part is to recognize when, when you're saying we've got people with amazing stories, you're absolutely correct. But go back to what's the most important thing. What do you want your audience to take away from a story? Yeah, the, the data versus dogma story. Right? I just said, you know, Copernicus, Bruno, Galileo. I actually used that story in context of explaining a mistake I because I went into a series of negotiations thinking that people were just going to look at the data and it would be very, very obvious. And I told people, you know what? I thought the argument was about data. Ended up it was about the audience. I should have reframed my stories. So when you're saying we have stories we need to tell, we have, I, I would challenge you and say, what's the story we need to tell? Is it that, you know, would John have to kick ass as a playwright? Or is the story, which I had this a metaphor for so many other playwrights who are out there? Or is it the story that he is telling is really the story of all Americans who happen to be Muslims? So when you come up with that story, then we've got PR people who can tell you where to tell it. Sir. I guess, how do you determine audiences and who's a good audience? 